Hello everybody, James here, story time with Dutch episode 51. Before we get to our special guest, who Dutch will introduce, of course, we have some things to plug always. So, Tales from a Dirt Road by Dutch Mantel, the world according to Dutch by Dutch Mantel, two fine, fine tomes written by the Dutchman himself. If you want them unsigned, go to Amazon. If you want them signed, email Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. I've written two books as well, Owen Hart, King of Pranks and Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion. They are also available on Amazon and very well rated they are as well. We also have a T-shirt. Pow! What do you think of that? You people mean nothing to me. <laughs> you can get them in the link. Uh, T-shirts in the link in uh, the description of this video and every other video. And Dutch is going to introduce our guest. We're going to do some news. And then uh, the Dutchman is going to interrogate our guest for as long as he's willing or his, or his battery holds up on his phone. So, uh, Dutch, take it away. <laughs> Uh, so are we talking news first? Are we? We are taking news, our, but you've our, got to introduce our our, our guest. Uh, well, I will. This is a guy who I wanted on the show for a long, long time. Good friend of mine. I spent a lot of time with him in WWE when I was there. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce the guy who I've got. I've got a lot to say about about him, Mister Damien Sandow. Damien, how are you today? I am lovely. How are you, Dutch? It's so awesome to see you again. It was funny. Like, I had no idea you wanted me on the show that long because uh, the second I heard it, it was like, yep, coming on, whatever. So I'm, uh, I've am i always been a big fan of yours, so it's a, it's a pleasure, seriously. <laughs> and we had a lot of conversations in WWE, flying to Europe or in the cars or in dressing rooms. And this is one guy that is never boring and can talk about anything. <laughs> Let me ask you, did you see Backlash? Uh, I did not. No, I um, I do not really watch. Uh, and I apologize. I just had a caller in. I've silenced all messages and calls. But uh, I, I don't um, really watch the WWE product that much anymore. But I, you know, on Instagram and stuff like that, they were on the island, right? Oh, yeah. And that's why I wanted to watch it, because I told everybody, I said, these fans are red hot. I oh, mean, oh my God, they yeah. are unbelievable. I mean, I've had my eardrums almost burst one night when I was in Roberto Clemente Coliseum, and they announced Carlos Colon, and it got so loud that it went up and up and up. And then my ears, they, they just, they felt like they just shut down, like bloop and dropped. Yeah. It. yeah. I guess that's nature's yeah. way to protect an eardrum. So listen, we'll be getting back Ooh. to, yeah. we're going to do some news right now. Jump in if you want to. And, uh, mm -hmm. James, I'll send it back to you. Okay. Then. So, uh, because you mentioned backlash and the crazy, incredibly enthusiastic Puerto Rico fans, uh, I mean, I suppose in general, talk about just like how enthusiastic the fans are down there, uh, and uh, Damien can as well. And also, you also wanted to mention Savio Vega, why he is so popular on the island. Well, I, I booked a company down there named IWA, and I'm not bragging or anything, but I worked for, they had two companies. I worked for the Carlos Colon Company. Uh, WWC and then IWA and we were doing like 12, 13 and 14 rating. I mean, the ratings is com comprised, I guess the same way down there as it is in the States. It's all local, but we were drawing like 600,000 fans uh, every Saturday morning, but they were kicking the crap out of this other company and the other company. And it was Savio Vega. He approached me because he owned part of the company and wanted to know, did I want to book it? And I <clears throat> had a money dispute with, with Carlos, which is not beyond the realm of possibility. So I quit there and I went to work for this other company. And this other company's ratings was 2.6 when I took it over. In about three months, I had them up to an eight or a nine. And the company I had just left had dropped down to like a seven or a six. They were going down. The company I joined, IWA, was going up. And Sebio was, I made him like a heel authority figure. Oh, he had heat. 
And that's why he's so over because the TV was dedicated for three years, almost dedicated to not to Savio, but in that circle. And we drew some huge, huge houses. So, which I told everybody, if you watch backlash, I mean, you'll see how hot those fans are. And when they in introduced him, I mean, you could tell it just by watching TV, how, how loud they were and he's over. And we should do a show one day just about Puerto Rico. And I know Damien's been in Puerto Rico, so he can tell you how crazy. Damien, those fans are crazy, right? I tell you what, I mean, yeah, I uh, I often say I have more scars from the fans than I do from anything I did in the ring there. And, uh, and you know, this was back, it was 2009, 2010 I was there. I was there for a year and a half straight. And, um, you know, after, you know, once you're on TV there and, and people recognize you when I was like, you know, this American talking about how the United States is better and, you know, just which I, I don't mean, by the way, I was I actually love the island and uh, some of the people there were wonderful uh, and, and to get to have some of the experiences I had there um, and, and, and as a whole, like the, the, the culture, um, it, it's just cool. Like, I, I love it. But uh, when you're an American, <laughs> um, you know, you'll uh, you'll get stuff thrown at you. Uh, the hot pennies, which I still have the scar from here, uh, they, they, they'll they take like hot pennies uh, with a pair of pliers, heat it up with a lighter. When you go to the ring, they stick you with them. I'm sure you've had that happen, Dutch. No. Well, they threw broken glass at me. Okay. All right. So I guess yeah. the hot hot pennies is a new uh, invention. I, I don't remember those. But yeah. those, those people would beat the living shit out of you. I remember... The only the two times I left the ring in the middle of a match, both were in Puerto Rico. Wow. And, and then they got mad at it. They said, why did you leave? I said, they were kicking the shit out of me. And I'm not going to stand in a ring and get hit by like, it was shards of like, like windshield glass. They was broken. And, and the, everybody plays baseball down there. Everybody's got an arm and they are pretty accurate. And they were ripping me up. I just left. And I, hey, I did you know that. What? I did that twice. There's, I told you. Remember the story about uh, when the the neighborhood, uh, let's just call it the neighborhood guy, decided he was going to throw a party, and uh, they had wrestling, and he like he paid us a pretty substantial amount of money um, to go do a show, and the ring was in an intersection, and uh, so this this was not <laughs> for Carlos. So yeah, I I. I remember that was the only time I was ever scared. Like, and I, I'll, I'll admit it. I don't care. Um, when you're just, you're literally in an intersection and there is no barricade around the ring and the cops are over by the food truck getting panadillas or whatever they're eating. And yeah. I'm in the ring and they just started throwing, I mean, I, a rock or something whizzed by my ear. So I have the epiphany. I go on the middle rope and I moon the crowd. I got up on the second rope and I moved the crowd on one side and I let them unload. Right. So I, I figured better my posterior than my, my head. And uh, so I did it one side, the other side, and they, they kind of like thrown everything they wanted to throw. Uh, and I was able to have the match. But uh, again, it, it was just, I was scared. I mean, it was like. This is the first time I ever heard this story. Oh no, no, no. I, I moon the crowd on one side of the ring and then the other side of the <laughs> ring because I wanted to get them, give them enough yeah. of a target to just throw everything. And like I was, and it was crazy because like when, you know, I knew I was going to get pelted. So I'm like, all right. Ah. And then like they were, people were still trying to throw stuff from the other side. So like that was coming down and it was just, oh God, I was like covering my head. and it was <laughs> You were at an actual intersection when cars going by? No, they had shut the streets down. Oh, I see. So this was in the, the housing projects. Oh, my God. Like, yeah, this is, was. Is this the housing project that's in East Liberty? I think it was. That's the biggest drug place in San Juan. I have no idea. I didn't see anything. I, uh, <laughs> I just, I showed up. I did my match. I collected my envelope and I went home. And the only thing that was in the envelope was money. What did, did Carlos say anything about this or did he know about it? No, or? I just, uh, I just, I, I remember I called the office. I got, um, Wilfredo and, uh, you know, oh God, Wilfredo, he was, 
<laughs> oh, he's he's too much. He is. Yeah, he is. Um, and uh, he just, yep, Carlos says it's okay. So, all right. So I went and did it. And it's not that I was missing a, a date for him. But, um, yeah, that was that was my one and only third-party booking there. Well, we'll so. get back to this when we talk about Puerto Rico just a little later. I'm so sorry. Then, we're still on the news. Sorry. Oh, uh, we're still on the news. I, I got to get back to the news. But anyway, Sabio Vega, James, go back to you. Yes. yes. It was, Hello. Okay. Sabio hey. Vega <laughs> is one of the biggest over guys in that island. WWE made a very strategic choice in picking him to be a part of the show, and they picked Carlitos, too. And, you know, I, I watched every bit of uh, backlash, most of it. But the final two matches, I don't think they could they could compete after. I mean, they couldn't follow Bad Bunny and Damian uh, Priest. They did, of course, with all the, the run-ins, and you had Savio, and you had Carlitos. And, but the last two had trouble following that, <laughs> my opinion. I am, I wish you would have talked more about crazy Puerto Rico fans. I was I was absolutely we, reclining. We, They're just enjoying it. Yeah, we're getting back. We'll get back to it. Okay, uh, we're going to skip the Brock Lesnar thing. That's fine. We'll do it another week. Uh, just before we get onto the main bit of news, uh, the death. Oh, I got a, I got one thing to say about Brock Lesnar. Oh, go on. He he bled in that match the hard way, mm -hmm. and WWE doesn't like that, but yet they couldn't stop it. As much as they may have not liked it, they can't go out there and stop the match. The place would have rioted. They were in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and and what what Aaron is saying, Damon is saying, that when they when they get mad, they get a they get kind of violent down there. And we'll get back to that in a minute. But and it, it really Puerto Rico is a topic just by itself. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine if, because right. um, this happened in WrestleMania uh, a month or so ago, where there was like the Hell in a Cell and Edge and Finn Balor, I think, and yeah. Finn gets a cut on his head, and then they stop the match for about three minutes. Can you imagine mm -hmm. the Doctor living if he would have stopped that match in Puerto Rico? Oh, well, it wouldn't been it, it wouldn't have been well received. The one thing about this show, it had a lot better security than <laughs> than what than what the Puerto Rican wrestlers saw on a day-to-day -day basis. Damien probably had no security at that intersection. Right, Damien? Well, like I said, we did, but they were at the um, the Panadilla <laughs> truck. And and, um, the, and the beer truck. Yep. Yep. So, you know, oh. I had to I had to do what I had to do, and uh, like I said, survived it and everything's cool. But, uh, yeah, the, the fans there, and, and here's the thing. I love wrestling down there. I no, wish, good. I wish that people were as passionate because I don't want to get too into it now. But like, I think Instagram and social media, it's given people a sense of like, almost like they're like snobbish critics to where like, oh, they're watching it and like, oh, all right, I'll get my little selfie and like, they're just not enjoying the show like they used to. And uh, I think, and you know, when you go to Puerto Rico and it's just like they want to see what wrestling really is. And and then they are that passionate. Um, as a performer, man, that's uh, that's what you want. Like it's it's way better. Well, when I when I booked the IWA, I was heavy on story. Yes, tell the story, and I would go out into the streets, and I'd send Savio with the camera out on the streets, and and it was something that I ran it all the way through the show. A little story. And I would wrap it up at the end. Then the next week, it may not have one. And the week after that, it would have one. So it wasn't a regular thing, but that was part of the reason that Savio was so over and Porter uh, and wrestling in general, because it was, you, I took it to the people. I made them the focus of it, not necessarily the, the for, performers that much, but and I really enjoyed my time. And somebody said, how did you ask me one time, how did you do so well with the IWA? I said, I would go out on the beach every day and I'd take a bottle of Malibu rum. And I would sit down and I, <laughs> I would sit out there and watch the people on the beach. And I said, you would be surprised 
how smart Mr. Senor Rum was nah. with his uh, with his ideas. He had some great ideas. And then about yeah. four o'clock, I'd pack it in. I'd go in and I'd write down what Malibu Rum had told me, and it mm. it'd usually be right. Hey, work for Hemingway. It did, but he was in Miami. No, he was in a Key West. Yeah, but, but same, I mean, it's all same vicinity. <laughs> same, same deal. Same deal. Hey, uh, James, what else we got uh, on the news? I was just looking at Hemingway. You have a more impressive mustache. Um, oh, not even close. No, not, not, I mean, please tell me you're sponsored by some kind of a, a beard oil, mustache oil company. We can't get them. We've we been can't trying. Get them right yet. We have been trying. We had a couple too- of in- bits of interest, and then just you just get ghosted. Wow. Yeah. And they're cheap, too. But I think I should be sponsored by uh, some kind of a mustache company. I think absolutely. If there's any mustache companies out there and you want to advertise on the show, hey, send me an email, dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com and I'll get back to you. Yeah. And if there's some sort of like beard growth oil company that wants to sponsor me because I've struggled, I struggle. Do you think dirty? Do you think the word like if we're using dirty Dutch mantel that could be discouraging sponsors? What if we did dapper Dutch mantel? Might be good. Will it get? We'll get you a monocle. Hey, they say that is what? What do they call that? That it didn't really happen. What's that called, James? What? They say that you remember something that oh the Mandela oh effect. the Mandela effect Mandela effect. Yeah. But I remember him with a monocle. Yes I, or no? I, Am I wrong? I uh have you ever seen I, him I, with a monocle? Who? The little Monop- guy that what the, the, the dapper guy. The, the pe- monopoly the guy? Yeah. The peanuts. No, guy. Mr. Peanut. Yeah, Mr. Peanut has a monocle. Okay. But they say it didn't happen. No, I think he has one right now. In fact, I have a jar of planters peanuts. I can go find one. <laughs> no, I'm googling it now. He's, he's got one. Yeah, he got one. Right, but they said no. He he never had one. That's the Mandela effect. I'm going bullshit. No, 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 no. He always had a monocle. Yeah, I thought yeah. I thought so too. Before we I, go I, down, I, before we go I down this rabbit just hole, look this up. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> before we go down this rabbit hole, whether the peanut had a monocle or not. Um, uh, serious news, Dutch. Uh, the death of Jerry Novak, uh, someone you wrestled yep. with many, many years ago that you want to make mention of. Yeah. I, I've known that guy almost since I got into uh, the business. And the big guy, he came from somewhere in Europe, Czechoslovakia, Serbia, Croatia, somewhere. Worked his way to Canada, I think, and then down to the States, became a wrestler. And a lot of people won't know who he is, but he was a great guy. And and I and his and my daughter and his daughters are are friends. So that's how I found out about it. And uh, I wasn't I, I wasn't really a close friend with him, but he was a good guy. And uh, my condolences to his family. Yeah, it's uh, definitely good to give him a mention because you posted a great photo of you two on Instagram from somewhere in the eighties, like a sepia. Uh, it, it was it was in Japan. I, I went around the world with that guy. Now uh, we are going to move on to the big news. Uh, this is why I don't tweet because I've no interest in Twitter or social media or anything like that. But um, I'm sorry, I'm bringing myself into this. Normally I don't. But uh, Jungle Boy. Now uh, have you have you heard that? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to call you Aaron one time and Damien the next. Which one do you prefer? I answer. I've had many more names than that. I will answer to all of them. It's all good. <laughs> what uh? What did Jungle Boy do? So there was a convention uh, the Sunday, the weekend before last, and quite a few people had written into uh, Jim Cornette's podcast and said that uh, there'd been reports that Jungle Boy was maybe less friendly than he could have been. And then there was a Q and A where he was rather uh, almost belligerent of some people's questions. And then one pe- person asked, uh, "Who would you go to advice for to put a match together?" And he said that the person he went to more than anyone else, uh, apart from saying that people about his age and his style, he said the one person who helped him put his match together was Luchasaurus. And then he said he would definitely not go to Billy Gunn 
for advice, who is a current agent producer there, because he loses his mind every single time um, Jungle Boy goes to him and suggests a Canadian destroyer. So he didn't he didn't respect Billy Gunn at all. Apparently not. No. Well, Jungle Boy should know. He he needs to be a little more uh, political when he speaks of guys that he works with in public. And I know Billy. Billy has a a little bit of a hot temper. And uh, I would hate to be around them uh, in a dressing room setting when Billy Gunn cuts loose on him. Billy Gunn is like, I don't know how old he is. He's he's well into his 50s. Yeah, he's late 50s. It doesn't matter. Look at the shape. It does not matter. No, look at the shape he's in. And I would advise Jungle Boy to keep a low profile. Uh, I mean, it's not, I'm not there. Uh, but Billy Gunn has a little bit of a temper, too. Uh, what would you say, Aaron? I'll say this. My, um, since I got back into wrestling and, and, and I, I only took a couple of years off, but it was like, like the generations changed hands uh, to where, you know, a lot of the people, they, they view the business uh, differently. And, um, and, and I don't think respect is something, and I'm not one of these people that's, Oh, you have to respect someone because they've been doing this longer than you. No, respect them. If they're a good person, respect them. If they have accomplished what you would like to accomplish. And Billy Gunn is as big of a star as you can be, in my opinion, I mean, look at the career he's had over the length of time he's had. Um, I've wrestled him several times. I, um, I'm i very friendly with him. Like, if I saw him, we would give each other the hug and, and talk and catch up. Um, and again, as a professional, I could not respect him more than I do. And if it's like the movie 300, right? When Leonidas says, here, each man is responsible for his own words and actions. Right. If look, if Jungle Boy wants to go to someone that hasn't been doing this that long or has had the international stardom um, as other people have. And and, and by the way, in AEW, when they say and then this should this should be what everyone says, in my opinion, who do you go to put your match together? Uh, We have Arn Anderson, Dean Malenko, Jerry Lynn, Billy Gunn, you know, people who have done this and, and are incredible at it and if you go to people more your contemporaries look you're welcome to do that and i'm not criticizing anyone but understand if you've been on tv for years and you have not progressed if if you are like this going stagnant (laughs) or if you have lightning in a bottle and i've seen this happen with people they have lightning in the bottle and they're here and then they don't know once any idiot can get over it takes a professional to stay over. Can you maintain their interests? Can you do this? And again, this is nothing. I'm not criticizing one person in particular. This is nothing against Jungle Boy because, like, again, I, I just don't watch the product. I haven't seen where he is or anything like that. Um, I've met him a few times. Very, very nice kid. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, but again, it, it, like, if he wants to go to certain people, great. And you know what? Like, we will all bear the fruits of our labor, right? So it, it's one thing or another. And um, I, if I was him, I would go to Billy Gunn. And, and if if someone someone told me something I didn't want to do, my first instinct would not be, oh, no, and then avoid the situation. Be Okay, why? I am genuinely interested why someone like you that has been doing this for so long, why do you believe this? Teach me. So that I can learn and then make a decision there for myself one way or another as a grown man. My opinion, but I know I th- it was long-winded, but. No, a good point. But I think that is the prevailing attitude in AEW or from what I'm, re- I, I, I'm reading. Hangman Page, Hangman Page, he says the same thing. He said, I don't need to go to anybody else. I do it all myself. So if they want to do that, that's fine. But they're going to reach a plateau where they don't know what to do. But not necessarily in their work, in their stories, is what what I'm saying. That's what's going to keep it going. But your story, your work has to reflect the story. 
But anyway, I'm talking. It's I'm one talking. thing to, yeah, right. Because because as we know, Dutch, and again, if, if they if anyone is listening to this and they don't know what you and I are going to talk about right now, guess what? They ain't as good as they thought. When you're wrestling, it's not just go to the building and, all right, who do I work in and what high spots do I want to do and this and that. No, no, no. You have to put a match together thinking where are we going to be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks from now, and how does everything from the way I walk to the ring to how long I choose to get heat on a guy, like, you have to factor all that stuff in. And then, again... If you're not thinking like that, you're playing checkers. No matter which way you cut it, you can be using the fanciest checkerboard possible, but you're playing checkers when there's other people that know how to play chess. And if you want to learn, you should maybe listen to them. You know, you can you can comment on this. I'm telling guys, when you go to the ring, that's your first exposure to a live crowd in that building. Sure. Read, read the room. Let them tell you what to do. If you get a lot of heat, you know it's going to be easy. If you don't get much, well, now you got to work at it. But you got to you got to be like that comedian on stage. You got to walk around the stage. And I've heard comedians tell me you got to find the hot corner. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and when you find that, now you got to work on it. But crowds are different. Some guys can read crowds, and some guys can't. Because they're not it, thinking about the crowd. It's about them. No. Well, well, I've seen a lot of guys. I've talked about this too. They work for the dressing room. They don't work for the people out. They want to do this crazy spot, which I guess looks good. It won't draw you a dime. It won't advance the story. But when he gets back in, can you see? Can you still hear me, Aaron? I can. St I can still yes. hear you. You go. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> oh my God, he's disappeared. Oh God. One sec, I'm pausing the recording. There we go, a phone call and a misbehaving dog there. All all sorted now? Uh, oh, yeah, we're good, we're good. <laughs> right, uh, I'll, I'll say my piece. So I put something on Twitter yesterday saying about... Uh, I heard the Jim Cornette clip talking about he got several emails, and then I was at this convention as well, and I, and, uh, I said... Uh, I was with my friend. I wasn't wearing my glasses. My friend had to tell me that Jungle Boy was sat about 15 feet away from me, just uh, at a table doing that basically trying to be like as, as small as possible and not like be seen now some people have said well he deals with a lot of anxiety and that's absolutely fine if, if you do and uh, it's a it's a problem but uh, it sort of doesn't also excuse the Q&A where he wasn't I don't know I, like I, I've suffered from anxiety in years gone by like horribly I've never lashed out at Billy Gunn not once so uh, I, I, I don't quite get the sort of anxiety <laughs> defense on that one Dutch well, from what I read about that same convention you went to, he wasn't very friendly to people. And that's part of it. If you go to a convention, it's a naturally assumed that you're going to be nice to people, friendly to people, sign autographs, shake hands, take pictures. But they said he was not, uh, he was not a perfect guest. In, in in that situation. Hmm. Now, I don't know about the, the Billy Gunn situation. I hope it improves. And I've said this about Tony Khan before, that he needs to step in and be a boss and tell these guys to get along because that can only hurt business. I'd like to ask a question to both of you, actually. Now, you've uh, when you were both in your mid-20s, early 20s, did you sort of have that same mindset of veterans who tried to tell you what to do and you thought, well, what do they know? They're old now, you know, that kind of thing. Uh -uh. We're, no? Uh, 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 uh. No. no. Not the guys I was around. Yeah, uh-uh. Because they'd slap the shit out of you if you got you in the ring you didn't listen. And I don't blame them. I tried to bill this guy, and he'd been, I don't know, he was an old-time veteran. I tried to bill him out of the corner, but I put my hand right under here. And I pushed him, but I was trying to push him. Before I even got there, he slapped me. We got back in the dressing room, and I says, you okay? He said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something. Don't you ever, ever try to do that move by just putting your hand underneath my armpit. He said, that hurts, and I'm not going for it. And then he showed me how to do it. You put the whole arm in there, then you throw me. And it makes sense. 
And guess what? I never, ever did it again. Mm -hmm. For young talent that are trying to learn the business, not talking to the experienced, uh, seasoned talent, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That's how you learn. I'll ask uh, one more question to Aaron, actually, um, and then I'll completely step out of the way. Who are your favorite road agents in the WWE when you were working there? Arn Anderson, Fit Finley, Dean Malenko. Um, and it, it's funny, in retrospect, I I appreciate him a lot more now. And oh, oh my God, I'm sorry. Uh, on the Father, forgive me. I forgot Mike Rotundo off that first list. And I, I mean, so it's Arn, Dean, Fit, and Mike Rotundo. Um, I, it was a blessing to work with them every day. Jamie Noble, I, was, I always got along with. He was always great to me. But it wasn't until after I left that I, I, I kind of went like, man, you know what? I really wish I would have picked Jamie's brain more. And um, <laughs> like... I, I just liked him as a person and like looking back that like the times when it counted, like the both money in the banks, he was there um, like as the agent and in the way, you know, he allowed us to put it together, like what he brought to the table, you know, cause his experience in doing this kind of thing and making it make sense. Um, I, I have a, a far bigger appreciation for Jamie Noble now Um you know, than I did when I was there. Not that I didn't appreciate him. You know what I mean? Um, I, I just, like, I put him now in that same category with all those uh, I just mentioned. So if that makes sense. Good guy. Yes. Good guy. Absolutely. And yes, and, and again, above all else, a good guy. Yeah, Dutch, really I'm good. out. So it's, uh, it's up to you now. Okay. Do the okay. interrogation. Let me, let me tell a story about agents. My first WrestleMania was in Hartford, Connecticut. I think it was WrestleMania 10. 11. I was with the blue. Okay, 11. You're right. I get it confused. We had a match, the Blue Brothers, Jacob and Eli, against Lex Luger and Davey Boy Smith. It was just, and it wasn't even on the pay per view, I don't think. I think it was like the warm up match. Before we went live with it, I think. It was the opener. It, it was the opener of WrestleMania 11. It was on the paper. Okay. Game. Okay. It was eight minutes, and I left these guys alone. And because they're the talent, I'm not the agent. Tony Gurria was the agent. Yeah. And I, left the, I left them alone, and they were talking, and I walked away, and I come back in about 45 minutes. I said, what do you got? Uh, we don't have it yet. What? It's an eight-minute match. How long sh should it take you to put this together? And then somebody suggested something to Lex, like, Lex, you do this. And Lex, sit back. I never will remember this. He sit back and he says, eh, I don't think Lex would do that. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody refer to them themselves in the third person. You know how long it took them to put that match together? Because they couldn't agree on nothing. It took them over two and a half hours. Even Tony Gurria was getting frustrated with it. And finally, I said, guys, why don't we do this? What would like we do? Let's do it like we did in Memphis. Go out there, do a couple of spots up front. Then, uh, Davey Boy, let them stop you. Get a little heat. Tag Lex. And Lex started to come back full way. Somebody goes out on the floor and Lex, do you finish? And they went, oh, yeah, that, that might work. Hell, if I'd have known that, I'd have given it in the first 10 minutes of the, of the meeting and we could have got out of there. Now, why is it so hard for guys to put together a match? I, I don't know. I've even said about Lex, Lex couldn't book himself because he would die on the vine. Because you got to know what your character is, what you're trying to get over. But that's what I would do. You can't do it without the agents. And anybody not listening to the agents, uh, well, you need to have management step down and say, hey, you got to listen to them. If you don't, if you don't want to follow the system, you need to go. And that would stop a lot of that. So let me ask you, Aaron, You, where, where did I first meet you? 
in it was in WWE. We had never no. met prior to uh to when you came to WWE that first time. <laughs> yeah, which is, but which I, is crazy cuz like but, but I had heard about you. Mm-hmm. And you know who I heard about you from? <clears throat> An old friend of yours, Mr. Kenny Bolin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> King B, well, I tell you how, what. How well do you know him? I know him about as good as I as I know anybody in the business. <laughs> Any good stories about him? This is story time with Dutch, so we're heavy on stories. When he was on, did he tell any stories about me? No, he likes you, though. I think the world of King B. But <laughs> there was nothing about the autograph signing at a funeral service. What is that? Here is the Kenny Bowen story. <laughs> All right, fans, get ready for this. And God is my witness. This was uh, this was how I remember it. King B's, um, it, I, I believe, was uh, his brother, half brother Timmy John, um, who consequently was raised by Colonel and Claudia Sanders. But that's a whole nother show. <laughs> um, and I'm talking about the Colonel Sanders from KFC. But yeah. Later on, like Timmy John's brother or, or father, someone had passed. So to show, now, now, who is Timmy John? King B's half brother. Okay, Kenny Bowen. Um, yes. So to show respect for Timmy John, King says, "Ah, I don't. Know, I think it'd be a good idea if we all came." And I was wrestling for OBW at the time, and. uh and you know, I, I used to go. There used to be free meals with King B. He'd go and hook it up at uh, you know, some kind of restaurant. There'd be all kinds of Applebee's and the, the different thick Texas Roadhouses involved and everything like that. That King would go and, and get the hook up, and we we'd leave like a ten dollar tip or something like that, and, and eat like, you know, uh, we, like King's no pun intended. But I'm sorry, I'm digressing. <laughs> we go to Eminence, Kentucky, which is about just probably twenty miles or so outside of Louisville. And we drive there, and he's got this Cadillac. And it's a pearl Cadillac with black tinted windows. The license plate says King B. Now, OVW, it's a regional television show, but it's a pretty popular show. I mean, people watch that. They know who everybody on the show is, especially in these, you know, the towns outside of Louisville, which is they don't get as many stations, whatever. So <clears throat> we go there, and uh, and this is unlike anything I've ever seen because I, I I'd never been to a – and it was a wake, you know, where they view the body, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and and this was, you know, again, little, little little country, little southern. Wait a minute. So you were going a wake. Yes. You were going to a wake. Yes. Did you know Did, that when you left? Well, one hundred percent, because I'd met his brother a few times, and like, oh, I see. like, it would mean the world to Timmy John if you went. Yeah. And, uh, you know what? Fine. I'll go. Uh, I, I'll, you know, try to be sympathetic because that's, I, I get it, man. You know, like losing someone close to you, it, it sucks. But we go there. Now, I don't think of this because everywhere I've ever gone with King B, he's brought that briefcase. And this is not just a regular briefcase. It's a briefcase that on one side has, I don't know what you call it. If it's not screen printed, it's, it's etched or engraved or whatever. It says Star Maker. Because he was Kenny the Star Maker Bowen. And on the flip side, BS for Bowen Services. And the S is a giant money sign. Now, I don't think about this, but he brings his briefcase in to the service. Right now, I go down. I'm a Catholic. I go down there. I kneel down and say a prayer and whatever. And there's other people and, you know, meeting everybody, the family. All of a sudden, King goes, hey. They got... uh, Finger sandwiches and brownies back there. Let's go. Let's go grab a seat. Now, everyone recognizes him. Okay. He is because he grew up there and he's like a celebrity because he's on television. And then they are treating him as such. So again, I'm like, wait a minute. And I, I've <laughs> taken like maybe two pictures at this point with people. All right. It was awkward, but I do it. We're sitting down. 
the family now starts leaving, let's just call it the main room, where the, you know, I don't want to call him a corpse, but where, where the main attraction is, where the reason for everyone gathering is. <laughs> I, I just, and I feel terrible, tell, but this is it, it is so Kenny Bolin, and it's like so. It, it's just I'll continue. The only people left with the main corpse is the actual funeral director and like the <laughs> owner of the funeral, or whatever. Yeah, the family has now formed a line to where I just think we're sitting down and enjoying some refreshments, but I we are behind a table. And I didn't know this. And we're talking. I'm taking pictures. I'm smiling. Right? Hey, I, my condolences. I'm so sorry, right? Someone goes, well, Kenny, this is kind of his family, by the way. I tell you <laughs> what, I watch you every, you know, whatever, but, I, but I've been working and I, I just can't get you. And I'm trying to record you on VCR. Or, man, I, I, I got to keep up on your stuff. He goes, well, funny you should mention that. And I hear <laughs> thud. Click, click. And he gets the best of Bowen Services volumes one through three and it sets them out. I normally sell these for, uh, you know, $20 on uh, internet and this and that. But I tell you what, family, I tell you what, hey, for $10, you can have it. And I'll even throw in a signed picture of Idle Stevens because I was Idle Stevens at the time. Has a stack of my 8 by 10s sits them in front of me, throws two Sharpies there, and I have to do an autograph signing. How um, many did you sold, sign? How many did you sign? Uh, probably, I, I mean, oh, uh, uh, enough to feel awkward. Like, I'd say around maybe 20, 30-ish. <laughs> I don't know, like around that area. It was, it was well over 15. James, you ever heard this story? No. You ever heard anything like this story? No, I, well, I have what, not. <laughs> Well, well, well but, that that that's Kenny Bolin. No, and the thing is, though, they were so happy that he did, and he did something good for them. Like they they were happy to see him, and he he made them feel good. He did give them a discount on the DVDs, but like at the end of the day, he made a dollar and made other people's day. So it's like, okay, go on. Now again, there's uh, there's so many other stories about him. Some not that didn't end as well, um, but he's again somebody that I uh, I do. Uh, I people have their opinion of him, but. I I really I I do love him. Well, let me ask you this: Kenny Bowler and I call a, a heat magnet. He can get. I told him the other day. I was talking to him, and I said, Kenny, if you could get as much heat out on the floor as you get in the dressing room, you'd sell out everywhere. But he did get heat out on the floor because people legitimately hated Kenny Bowler. And he's easy to hate. I mean, Cornette's easy to hate, too. And that's why he got into managing. He followed Cornette. Then they had a big falling out. And we covered that on, on, on the show that when he was on. But there's not a dull moment with Kenny Bowen. He will entertain you. Oh, absolutely. And I, I tell you what, um, as a – because I'm, I'm into managing now, like I, I will always be, you know – Jimmy taught me so much um, in, in terms of like like the like Jim Cornette, Rip Rogers. Um, you know, I, I owe both of them a lot. But I, I take a couple Bolinisms. I'm not going to lie. Like there are things that King has done as a manager that I mean he's he's been spot on with. And I also think as a commentator, him and Dean Hill were one of my favorite commentary teams like ever in the business. And I'm like, I, I consider myself fortunate that like they've called the majority of my matches in OVW. And um, I, I, I thought they were great. Both of them. Let me ask you this. How many bookers did OVW have? They had, they had uh, Paul Heyman, Cornette. Then they had another one, maybe which one, which one did you work for? And which one did you enjoy the most? Okay. So I was there for Jimmy originally. Yeah. Then it was Paul. Yeah. Then <laughs> Greg Gagne. Uh, um, I forgot about him. Yeah. Uh, who I enjoyed working for him. Um, again, I, I think, you know, people have different experiences and, and I was, it was very much high 
what are we doing for business? And I, as a talent, right, I've always, I've never been one of these people that like needs to know a booker outside the ring and get, you know, no, like I, I have always respected the kind of, Hey, what's up? What do you need today? Okay. These are the marching orders. If I, I have any questions or objections, I'll let you know there. We discuss this. We come up with a plan as quickly as possible. Let's get on to the next town, shall we say, right? So I, I've I, I've kept a lot of bookers at arm's length, and I, I for a, a reason I don't get too close to people because it's just at the end of the day, you know, I, I find it kind of disingenuous. Um, but that's I, I don't know. I have no idea how we even get on that. But but like, which Greg, one did I you enjoy? A, which one did you enjoy the most, Greg? A uh, big, big, big God, decision. No, so it's here. a toss up between Jimmy and Paul. Um, G- all right, here, here's what I can say. Jimmy gave me the foundation to like understand what the business is, right? Not just not moves, but like what the wrestling business is, and to be in angles. It was like my first, you know. My, my first real exposure to working for someone who, and, and I say this because um, like Kowalski didn't do a show. He was very, um, he would do like spot shows and house shows, but didn't have a, an actual television promotion. So someone killer, that's killer, called, You're talking about Killer Kowalski? Yes. Yes. So, so you started with him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Back when I was 16. And, um, but like working for someone that is qualified to be writing television. Big difference. Like I, I did the the booking for Championship Wrestling from Hollywood for about two years, and um, you know, again, from talking to you, from being around Jimmy, from all the you know Heyman, all these people, I said okay. Like I, I kind of surmised how to do this, and I came up with a plan, stuck to it, and uh, they won an award for the first time, I guess, since they've been on the air. And again, I'm not saying whatever, but like when this is done correctly and you approach this correctly. You know, there's a reason you listen to veterans because if veterans are still around, and, and this is some logic now, okay? And I, I don't <laughs> want to get off topic, Dutch, but like here, here is yeah. just some for, for anyone like debating, like, oh, you're just you're you're mad because you're not in WWE. No, you know what? I I've had opportunities to go work for other places recently, and I chose to be in NWA for reasons I, you know, again, my reasons mm-hmm. and my reasons alone, and. A big one of which is our locker room because we do not tolerate certain things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We, we we keep it as old school as we possibly can uh, in a good way to where we want to help people and like we want to see people do good and get over. And and there's 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 a very positive environment. And uh, and that that is something. But if, if you look at logic, right, look at the way the business is. If a veteran if someone's been doing this. 20, 30, 40 years, and they mm-hmm. are still employed. They are still getting a paycheck. Chances are they know something. Yeah, they kind of know what they're doing. They kind of yeah. know they know how the game is played, too. That's yes. what a lot of the new talent don't understand. They think it's moves and the, no. You got to play politics too. Yeah, to where you think you're you're safe in an environment, right? Well, when your environment crumbles and you still want to wrestle, what will your value be? Will you be the the guy or girl that for the first six to twelve months you do the indies, it's hot, but then what happens after that? How do you keep yourself fresh? How do you keep yourself relevant? If you if you do not have a foundation to stand on in this, ultimately your house will fall down. But look at the people that are still actively doing this, that are still relevant. Mm-hmm. Bottom line. You, you, you brought up NWA. How's Billy to work for? Amazing. I'm very mm-hmm. honest with you. Um, Good guy. I chose to stay with NWA and, um, you know, like fortunately, like I, I, I've always been okay financially. Um, so it wasn't about the money necessarily. Uh, it was about trying to create, trying to build something, uh, and frankly, being appreciated as a talent. 
uh, and and respected as a talent, genuinely respected, uh, you know, by by the powers that be. And um, you know, look, uh, Billy has always kind of done things his own way and thought outside the box. And it's not unlike me. And and you know this, we you know me for years, right? We've had kind of several fairly deep conversations to where like I. I tend to just see things in a different way, right? And, and like whatever task I'm given, I'll, I'll analyze it and whatever my brain does or doesn't do, um, mm-hmm. kind of like I'll I'll try to mold it into something that's that's watchable, right? Or, or that's passable or, or God forbid entertaining. Uh, but that's because I have the foundation I have to fall back on. So there you go. You know, I'm, to, the, to the people listening, Billy, when I said Billy, Billy Corrigan is – is who I'm talking about. He's the head of the NWA. And I'm glad you brought that up because I intended to ask you about our friend, Joseph. Yes. Jo- Joseph Hudson. You came up with a, it, it was your idea question mark. Okay. So no, here's like, and, and again, this is for, if, if you've never seen it, people, you need to go back on YouTube and look this up because to me, it was brilliant. And there were so many people involved. Um, so first round of NWA tapings, right? I was out of the business. Right? Mm-hmm. Done. Uh, I was actually in Hawaii filming an episode of Magnum PI. It was Labor Day weekend. I had like four days completely off in Waikiki. I was just happier than a pig and slop, right? And I get a phone call. Hello. Hey. About the NWA. Yeah, I know. Congrats. You need to come back to work. No. Nope. And it was it was Dave Lagana. Mm-hmm. Um but uh now he goes, just just trust me on this one. All right, fine. Plane ticket, go. And it was the setup like, I mean, it was Georgia Championship Wrestling. Uh, if Georgia Championship never went away. You know, they it, it the that that pre same building, it, right? Same building? Uh, it was, no, it was uh, like it was Georgia Public Broadcasting Studios, but it was like the next block from where they filmed it. I but mean, it, Peach, it was this was in Atlanta. In Atlanta, yes. Yep. On Peach Street, on Peach Street Street. I think it was, yeah, or off okay. of Peach Street Street. I know um, where it is. So it like, and I, I say this that pre-COVID NWA was absolutely magical. Mm-hmm. I mean, from the set to just everything. Um, I mean, we had a hell of a roster. And uh, and again, we have a hell of a roster now, uh, too. But, like, it, it was just a really – couldn't have asked for a better, like, welcome to – you know, like, welcome back, NWA, or, or like, wh- whatever it is, right? Not that NWA ever went away, but it was a uh, rebirth of it. Could not have gone off any better. So I'm hooked now. What the hell am I going to do? All right, I'm thinking, oh, great. I got to come up with a new character. I got to do this, do that, whatever. Um, he says, hey, I want to put you with uh, with Josephus. He was doing, um, you know, the, the Josephus character. He's like, you know, we, we want to give a new character. We're going to call it Question Mark. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I see the getup. And it, I mean, it's something out of 1980, right? It, it literally, <laughs> it's, it's a black mask with a white question mark like uh, a black singlet and yellow tights, right? It, it, it's, I mean, and he even had, and they were actually, I think they were uh, Tony Fox tights that he got from Jerry Lawler because they were, they were legitimately so old school. They had the knee pads sewn into them. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like they tried to like replicate anything. No, this was just genuine. Like he looked like it, it was, he was out of 1980. So I said, okay, cool. My brain starts going I'm like, all right. So, He's like, they wanted to be a parody, right, of, of kind of that old school nostalgic feel. So I said, okay, great. On the surface, this is awesome. But with every good character, you need levels of it. Like you need, like, okay, you need your exterior in terms of what do they call you, what do you wear, what kind of moves do you do, you know what I mean, all that stuff. But then there's there's the different levels of it that when a character has depth, not only, <clears throat> excuse me, not only will that character be more intriguing and compelling on both the television screen and in front of a live audience, 
but you're going to have so many more doors open because there's more opportunity. So we're sitting there thinking the show Cobra Kai was really popular at the time. Of like the <laughs> spin off a karate kid, right? And I'm thinking, all right. And I was just wanting an excuse to get a karate suit. So we're there and I'm thinking, okay, like old school. And I said, ah, you know, and I, and I was thinking along the lines of like the Mongolian stomper and, you know, from like, mm -hmm. like in other words, the, the, the parody of the, the heel that they would bring in to work Dusty and he, he's, he's been to Mongolia and he knows the Mongolian spike and this is going to be what ultimately defeats Dusty for the title or, or something like that, right? Like I'm obviously, you know, using examples that may or may not have happened. <laughs> um, I, uh, extrapolating, so to speak, I guess you could call it that or, or reverse extrapolating, but um, I think I just invented a word. You're welcome. Uh, but <laughs> But ultimately, we said you're going to be a a karate guy from Mongolia. We're all excited. We go to tell Billy, and Billy goes, "It should be Mongrovia. We should invent a country." Hey, on board with it. <laughs> and Josephus, my brother's a graphic artist. I'm going to have him design a flag at once. So he designed them up. Which, by the way, the Mongrovian flag still and in the NWA shows. And the TV tapings, we still have the Mongrovian flag. That's a little memory to him. Um, but uh, so, so the we, story, the story about him, you invented the story completely. Invented it. like he he he's from a country called Mongrovia. I I met him on a movie set. He was a fight instructor, and he is now teaching me the ways of Mongrovian karate. And I have <laughs> earned. I am the first American to earn a third degree black belt in Mongrovian karate. Great story. And the rest, as we say, was just BS. We would go out there. You he had me laugh. Oh my god! Because because his whole thing was he was he couldn't understand English. So I was trying to help him in the ways of you know the West, shall we say? So the crowd loved him. They hated me because I was trying to deceive him, and you know taking advantage of his his not knowing the culture over here. Um, so I, again, it was similar to what me and Miss had. They loved him. They hated me. And we were just off to the races. And it wasn't that hard. You know what I mean? It was an organic story that was allowed to grow. You know, and, and how that, long that, how long did you have this gimmick with them? Got right up until the pandemic. So it was it was going on a year, um, close to it. And um, you know, pandemic happened. And then uh, you know, we know um it it I when I got the call with him, I tell you that one, and you know this Dutch. You get numb after a while, as as much as we yep. hate to admit it. You still feel bad, right? But if if a normal person's close friend or since someone they spent that time with was to untimely leave this earth or, or leave yep. this earth in an untimely fashion, rather, it affects them, and, and we have to at times develop like this armor. Not that it doesn't sting. But it's kind of like it's part of being in the business. If you've been doing this any length of time, and it's it's horrible. This one, it, it, it crippled me. For yep. when, when I initially and, found out, I was crippled. For and, for and for the people that are listening or maybe not follow this question mark or Joseph Hudson, what uh, Dame is talking about is he passed away. He had a heart attack at home in Nashville where he lived. And uh, and it was quick. I mean, just like and and died and and I got the call too. I got a call from his from his girlfriend, and she told me, and I couldn't believe it because he was a really really good guy. I actually yeah. trained I trained him and her, and he was always a, a and a, he he had a different sense of humor too, but he was funny. And he called yes. us. Did yes. you know he was autistic to a degree? I did not. I did not. But but he was the and he told me I'm autistic. But I'm at I'm at the highest functioning level. Oh, and he, he was brilliant. Yes. So he many was. Ways. And a great musician, wrote music. And the reason he told me that you could tell I'm autistic if you know anything about it is because he never raised his voice. Have you ever heard yeah. him raise his voice? He always talks in a monotone. 
but very good to talk to and very intelligent. But what I'm telling you is your work and NWA with question mark was, was brilliant. I went back and watched you, as man. many as I could. And I, I was a big, big fan of that. Thank you. But that was, I mean, he, he taught me, right. Cause, cause, cause he would go to me for advice and how we do this. And, and it was like little things, right? Like, okay, they, they hate you and they love me. What do we do? Well, all right. Fortunately. And I, I would call him sensei when, once this guy going, that was mm -hmm. my, my real world name for him. Um, this is a very easy situation. This is just like with Miz and I. Here's how we play this. Here's like everything is timing, yada yada. That's all the the uh, the boring stuff. But the cool stuff was that, like, I had had a very very bad taste in my mouth when I left wrestling. Very bad. Yeah. Um, and he through like the popularity of that character, right? Like, I I have to a degree taken for granted that. When I show up anywhere, like I will garner some kind of a reaction, right? And if I don't get, get as lot of a reaction as I want, I un, I know how to get them there right away. I have that skill set because then it goes back to how we've been trained, right? Talking mm -hmm. to veterans, um, learning from veterans, right? How many times have I picked your brain on stuff, <laughs> you know? And, and you weren't even. But you, uh, but, but but you covered it with you weren't you weren't telling me you were picking a brain. You were just asking questions. Yeah, yeah. And I was and I was answering because you wanted to learn. Yeah. So if somebody wants to, live, I don't volunteer any information unless it's requested, because of that very reason. I don't. Hey, if the guy he may not want it, so if you yeah. don't want it, don't ask for it. I mean, don't yeah. even engage me in conversation like that. Uh, but we had a lot of great conversations, and but you but you were always the type that could soak it in and kind of understand it. A lot of guys can't even do that. I, I don't know why they got into wrestling. Some of them, they don't really understand the game they're in. No, and some, they, and some, and some do. So yeah. you, you brought up your uh, association with uh, WWE. You were teamed up with Cody Rhodes for how long? About a year, year or so. And what were what were you call what were you guys called? The road. Oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, road scholars. Uh, team. No, it, it was team road scholars. Yes, that was it. Yeah. Uh, and I think you did some great work with him. Oh, thank you. I mean, but I think your best work. Well, I remember two instances when you were with the Miz, mm -hmm. and they called you Miz Dow. Yeah. Yeah. And you. <laughs> And you were like his stunt double. Yes, yes. And you would go out there, and you just invented that during the match, right? Yep, yep. I mean, they didn't say everything he does. You do? Oh no, no, God no, no. And I remember I was I was there. I was with WWE at that time, and I'm watching the match, and I see him take something, and then all of a sudden I look out. You're outside the ring. Or you may have been in, I don't know. But you took the same bump with nobody touching you. The yeah. stunt, and I I popped. I went, my God, I have never seen that in my life. But it made sense. I mean, I don't know how long you can take something like that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. at the moment, I I don't know what Michael Cole or the or the commentator said, but but you were doing your job and, and you got it over. So let me ask you about Cody. Is he one of the cheapest guys in wrestling, or did he say you were one of the cheapest guys in wrestling? He probably said I did. Yeah, that's what he said one time. He said, man, I'm cheap. <laughs> he says, but he said, that Sandow, he takes it to a whole nother level. Is that true? That was mostly done to upset him. Um, <laughs> and, and, and no, like I, uh, I tend to, again, like when it comes to spending money on me, I, I, cause I've always been told it's not how much money you make. It's how much money you save. And look, I've, I've made some financial decisions that are, you know, again, they, they, they paid off. Everything's cool. Like I don't necessarily need wrestling, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, like, no, I mean, I, I also like there, there's a balance. You have to be able to enjoy life too, but like on the road, um, yeah, Cody and I would like, I, it would get under his skin and stuff. And we were, we, we were actually, I, I thought, good travel buddies. Like, I, I had a lot of fun with him. Um, 
and uh, and and we were just again like very much we, we would call ourselves the uh, the New Age Midnight Express because that's we were we were bumping working heels, and uh, but we had a good time doing it. What time? How long were you in WWE? The, the last I time? couldn't even tell you, Dutch. Like you were there when I so. got. Yeah, you were there when I got there, 2013. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then 2013, 2014. Yeah. And what was your most enjoyable time in WWE? Um, again, Mizdow was cool and Sandow was too. I, I never thought they fully explored what they could have with the original Sandow. With the, I mean, the intellectual savior of the masses with the blue robe and everything like that. Like, I thought that character really was kind of cut short and not given a chance to evolve into its full potential. But, um, hey, that's the way the business goes. And the the good news is that you can always take a character and give it a new character name, right, and and have your vision of where that character could have gone and morph it into something else under a new character. So, tell you know, legally, it's not intellectual property. It's nothing like that. And it's still the same essence. And I've always been a fan of, like, look, WWE can own a name. They cannot own the talent. And I mean that as both, well, um, you know, like the person and the person's ability um, to do their job. Right? Like, they can never take the talent away from the talent. So that's what I've always kind of banked on. And um, – like I said, what I'm doing in NWA now, I, I'm having. I mean, I'm not even scratching the surface yet with it, but I, I dig it. So, but but NWA, they don't have a TV outlet. It's We're on YouTube, on YouTube right? right now. Yes, we have YouTube right now. NWA tell Power. Then tell the people how they can find that. So if you go to NWA on YouTube, you just type in NWA Wrestling. You'll get the NWA channel, and every Tuesday at six oh five, it's NWA Power, and then on Saturday mornings, it's NWA USA, and. Um, you know, again, we're a growing company, and uh, and the the business model is slow and steady. And look, things are being fine tuned. There's there's just a a bunch of things in play right now um, that are really really positive. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a company, because look, the pandemic it, it it kind of screwed up everybody's plans, right? But like everybody else, you regroup, you know, shake the dirt off, and you go forward. And then I thought NWA's yeah. did a great job of it. So so NWA show down during the pandemic kind of oh yeah yes okay okay that's what i thought can i jump in no, briefly me... i'm sorry i just want to ask something uh someone asked me to ask you this uh did you ever meet lanny poffo or did you base the original damien sandow character on the genius no so the original damien sandow character i was um watching rip rogers who trained me one day and uh, we were in tampa and he had those pink tights and everything. And I'm like, oh, cool. Let me try that. So I, I started wearing pink tights at a house show. And then that was working. So then it was like, all right, what can I do to like cover up, like make the pink tights more of a production? Well, I cover them up with a robe. And then and that it was Dusty's idea to get the blue robe. And it, it just kind of evolved, right? And then I, I did a cartwheel. And... <laughs> I don't know if Vince saw that and thought the genius, but like I didn't know I was going to be the intellectual savior of the masses until about 15 minutes before I was going to debut on SmackDown after WrestleMania. Um, that was the first time I heard the intellectual savior of the masses. So I was like, all right, cool. Um, and, and, and I think they may have gotten that because I'm just a person like when I look at people, like what they're doing, like in promo class, everyone was trying to talk tough and this and that. And I just tried to speak a little eloquently. You know what I mean? I, I just tried to, you know, use a couple words, more than two syllables. And um, and so, like, the Damien Sandow character was this, this again, complete just melding of, this, of different. This is what I, I wanted to tell you. You could take, and I saw them put all kind of stuff on you. <laughs> but everything they put on you. This is what you did with it. I watched. You would take it seriously, hmm. and you would make every one of those things work. But they never stuck to one. How many? How many different characters did you do? Are imitations of people? I honestly don't know. I cannot tell you. Um, 
Didn't you do John Adams or Thomas Jefferson? Something, or something like that. Like yeah, that? I just thought, I remember that. I had a pioneer hat on or something. And but everything yeah. they everything they gave you, you somehow right. made it. They didn't. They didn't have an. I, I tell the fans fans now the writers they can come up with an idea. They can't come up with a uh, how to get it over. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to present it. That's mm -hmm. your job. And you yeah. presented it in a way that made it entertaining and it made sense because you did it. But you you did something else. You did a lot of things I remember there, but they never stuck to one of them. No, because again, you need you, consistency you, to get over, right? As you absolutely. know, and as we tell people, but again, people don't want to listen. They have no idea that to get over on and, and, and uh, you know what I want to back up because I want to give Josephus his due and then we'll come if that's okay Dutch um what I was originally saying with Josephus I was at a point in my life where I didn't appreciate what I had as he got his character over and was getting like these lines and autograph sessions longer than a lot of top guys at the company and, and like he, he was going through this like he was experiencing like really stardom for the first time he was so appreciative to me and it, it caused me to re-examine my relationship with wrestling and to be like, wow, because I, I res respected and loved him as a person. And um, like through him, I found like this kind of reconciliation with wrestling. So I, I owe that to him immensely because it's been the best thing that's happened to me in a very long mm -hmm. time. It's to kind of like just reaffirm the sense of identity. Um but uh, but fast forwarding to that now, um, what I, I I coined the term when when I was booking right in uh, in the Hollywood show. It is North American television wrestling, which is stories. You have mm -hmm. characters that people can make an emotional decision on. Do the do I like him or do I hate him? And they they'll, they'll do it pretty quick, right? Um, you know, Dick Murdoch did not have a big fancy costume, but when he spoke, you knew exactly what you thought, right? I mean, you dirty Dutch oh, Mantel, yeah. oh, dirty yeah. Dutch Mantel. When you showed up on TV, on my TV screen, within five seconds, I pretty much knew what I thought of you. And the dirty was a tip off. Absolutely. Again, there's an art to this. There is an <laughs> art to this. No, right. But, People don't want to learn. To get over on North American television, you need consistency, right? You need repetition. Patience. Come down to, yes, some come down to the same music, beat the guy with the same move, right? Conditioning. And what I tell people, listen, it's funny. Some people listen, some people don't. I, I tell all the people, they, they want advice from me. Your camera operators and your announcers, they are the two best friends you have here because that is how the world is going to see you and the announcers are going to tell people what to think about you. Mm -hmm. Are you a good guy or a bad guy? Are you cheating? Oh, look at that dirty Dutch. He's cheating again, right? Like, and I'm again, I'm being very basic, but that's what it is. And Absolutely. And there is a reason, right? Jeff Jarrett, I, I watched this. This was about two, three months ago. I'm flipping through the, the channels, and Jeff Jarrett is uh, AW. The crowd is going nuts. I mean, they are just losing it. And he's in a tag match with someone. They're not doing flips. And, yeah. But the crowd was going nuts. Now, if I am a young guy and I see that, and I see a guy like Jeff, and, and by the way, there is like the, the Double J character, like the, the showmanship, when I was growing up, that was my favorite wrestler, like mm -hmm. for, for a period of time. No, I, I'm such oh, a fan he'll of that. He'll, he'll love that. No, oh, no, no. There was double <clears throat> J. I, I mean, oh, my God. Like, in terms of showmanship, no one I, – I think he was better than Sean. And, 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 you know, again, my opinion, like with the horse and the light-up glasses and the whole – you know what I mean? The, the, the outfits he had. Oh, my God. It was – my opinion, the only one that came close in terms of showmanship, not in ring ability, was Johnny B. Bad. You know, I, I think Jeff is uh, far more a technician, and, and obviously Jeff's psychology 
has once again proven itself because someone who doesn't do these things was on AW and on television, that crowd was going nuts. You could have thought they were in Puerto Rico. They, they cared about it. They were invested in it. Now, as a young guy, to not go, huh, how do I do that? <laughs> right? That is asinine. So, uh, again, and, and I've actually tweeted about this because I have no, you know, I, I've met Jeff a couple times. Seems cool. Um, I, I've never worked with him. I will probably never work where, with him. Where can we work in the fans find you on Twitter? Oh, and uh, the, oh, no, I'm sorry. Twitter is Aaron's Thoughts, A R O N S Thoughts. So there you go. Um, what are you talking about before we get too deep in this? What was your relationship with Vince in WWE? You talked to Hi, him much? Doing? No. No, me no. either. Here's the thing. I'm on the man's TV show, right? He's made his decision. Now, I can and, – and, and there were there was, I think, maybe two or three times where I've had to – and this is over the course of five years, like, hey, can I talk to you about this, right? And uh, one of the times Miz was there and – the man's busy. He has a bunch. He's worried about shareholders and all that stuff. This is what I'm doing. I need to go make this a grand slam. Whatever pitch they decide to give me, hook or by crook, I need to knock this out of the park in terms of the television audience. Right? That's it. Bottom line. Uh, you know, again, he's got enough people lining up to kiss his posterior. Um. I, number one, am not going to do that. But number two, if my work does not speak for itself, right, then, okay, then I, I don't I don't want to have to to do anything, right? Now, look, politics is involved. You have to get to know people, right? You have to get over with people in the back. But to not have anything to say to somebody and to go out of your way just to be, hey, what the heck? I mean, come on. No. If I got something <laughs> to say, I'll say it to you. If you don't like what I'm doing on your show, <laughs> tell me. It will be corrected. We move on. Who w w Was there anybody in WWE the whole time you were there that you didn't much care to be around? Not disliked, but you just kind of kept a distance from them because of, you know, there are some people that are just like, yeah. like I, I call heat magnets, that if you really associate with them, it rubs off on you a little bit, or you can be deemed like in that camp am i honestly no honestly no i i can like looking back um there hasn't been anyone that i'm like oh i just i don't want to like i i can pretty much get along with anybody um mm -hmm. and, and and as we said like i am very careful as to who i really let in uh in terms you know who i sit with on the bus and and we have these in-depth conversations like i don't do that with everybody. In, in fact, there are very few people in the business that actually know me, know me. So, uh, and that's by design. Well, before we go further, I just got to say that when I heard that you were released by WWE, what a missed opportunity. Oh, thank you. That They missed it totally because I don't think they utilized you to what you could do. Thank Cause you. you're very, you're a very talented guy. I appreciate it. I don't, I don't put many people over. <clears throat> well, I hate most people anyway, but, uh, Amen to that. <laughs> Amen to that. but what are you doing now? You're acting. Yeah. Um, so when I left wrestling, I had some acting opportunities come up. I was really starting to get rolling. I did a bunch of, um, shows for, uh, network TV. I did midnight, Texas did three episodes of that. Uh, did um, better things for FX. Uh, there might have been a couple others in there somewhere, but then um, did Magnum PI, and I'm thinking, all right, here we go. This is a big break because I was I was the lead heel in the episode. You know, work begets more work. What's Pandemic the name of this? Hit. Magnum PI. It? Okay. Um, and uh, so work begets more work. Of course, pandemic happened. Everything got wiped out. All right, whatever. Or the business just stopped. Um. And then once it started again, you know, started doing like some indie movies here and there. And, uh, you know, that, that's that been good. And then I, I was living in L.A. And then I got to a point where I just was like, you know what, the same for me. Then on a whim, when I decide to leave L.A., um, because you don't have to live there now. Everything is over the phone, you know, on Zoom and Skype. But uh, I got an opportunity to be in the show Heels, which films in Atlanta. 
So mm-hmm. I ended up in Atlanta last summer. I was pretty much in Atlanta, you know, like half a summer filming Heels, which was great and made me a cast member. So like I'm praying for season three. We'll see. And, um, you know, been doing some other stuff uh, around I never, here. I, I, I never saw Heels. You you would like it. I mean, there's there's very few shows, you know what I mean, that. It, it is about I, some a small independent company in Georgia yeah. or Alabama. Yes, and uh, it's uh, Georgia. And then um, I, I just, I dig the show because it's like the writing, it's it's accurate in terms of like, you know, like the problems wrestlers have. So they, they've definitely done their research and they, um, you know, they know, uh, like Chris Bauer's character, I love. Um, he, he, he does such a great job at that. And then Michael Malley too. Um, you know, they, these, these guys have really kind of dived into it, but at past that, it's a show about family, Mm -hmm. you know, and the relationships we have with family, like you could take wrestling out of it and, you know, put, you know, the, the family Truck um, truck driving business or the family, uh, you know, um, air purifier manufacturing business. I'm staring at an air purifier in case you haven't noticed. (laughs) Um, but, and it, and it would have the same thing. It's just, it's just such a really cool, um, aesthetic to have wrestling be a part of that. And, uh, and again, it's just, it's such a great show to work on. Great. I'm going to go, I'm going to go watch that because I haven't watched it yet. I heard about it, but I never watched it earlier. I was talking about this guy and I said, we get back to him at the end. It was a guy that we met in Puerto Rico. Oh, and his name is Victor Jovica. And Victor Jovica, ladies and gentlemen, is from Croatia that migrated to Canada, then to the United States. And I really don't know how he got into wrestling, but he met Carlos Colon in one of those Canadian companies up there, and they both went to Puerto Rico. And he's one of the owners now. But he he can't he he doesn't speak English well, but at the same time he doesn't speak Spanish well, <laughs> and he's in Puerto Rico and he has an accent. Now I want I want to hear the accent that that Joe Vica does. This is perfect, folks. If you don't know him, look him up because this guy is a he's a character. So, okay, yeah, and and when what you said, I mean, and it is, he speaks this thing, right? Because, like, when I got there as an American, you know, I I thought I had a hard time understanding him, right? But he would speak Spanish, and I thought his Spanish was just, it must have been extremely fluent. Well, I found out that Carlos was like, no, we can barely understand what he's saying. And then (laughs) when his family came over from Croatia, they said, like, oh, we can barely, his Croatian, we can barely understand him anymore, this and that. He must be good at Spanish. So we we deduced. He speaks a third of three different languages, which ultimately make up the one language known as Jovicaism. But here is the thing. And I there's a lot of Americans that that have a kind of a negative taste in their mouth. I I love Jovica. Jovi, I, I he was an instrumental part in my time in Puerto Rico. I still have the shirt he gave me because people said how you know he didn't like to give free things away. He gave me and I I do. I have that shirt. That is my one piece of like nostalgia that I, I hang on to from Puerto Rico, right? Because I'm not a big souvenir guy, but I that I cherish that shirt. So he speaks a third of three different languages, but he is very assertive in letting you know how he feels with his body language and you somehow understand what he's saying. Like for instance, <laughs> hey let me tell you something <laughs> to you right now. Like, you know what I mean? There'd be that. Um, <laughs> there was another one like, hey, who in the hell do you think you are doing? I mean, there would be those things, but it would, as a talent, you would listen to him. And um, and and you would, uh, like, you respected him. And, and you said, right, there was an issue of a guy that thought he was going to get one over on him. And Joe Vika, he straightened him out real quick. Like right, he. So I told you that story about the guy that had been bad mouthing him. Yep. yep. Here's a story. <clears throat> we were in yep. uh, a big a town, went out pretty big arena. I think it was in Cogwis, I think, or somewhere. 
but he said he'd been he'd been on social media all week. I'm gonna go over there Saturday night to the show. And I'm gonna punch Jovica out. <laughs> And so everybody knew it. So we're all standing around like in the little hallway and Joe Vika standing there. And somebody said, Joe Vika, he's here. Where is that son of a bitch? And the guy walked up, Joe Vika knocked him out. Dude. Yep. <laughs> and they, and they, he walked in and they carried him out. It was that quick. <laughs> Bam. And uh, <laughs> he is too much. So if you don't know who I'm talking about, which you probably don't, just go on uh, Google oh. or and look up a picture. He looks like the Puerto Rican equivalent of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and kind of like talks like said, if, or, or like a Castro. Because if, if Puerto Rico had a dictator, it would be Jovica. <laughs> I mean, but like, he just, uh, but, but again, like I, he taught me so much about like the business, right? Just by being around him and like learning how to survive, right? And, and that's the thing. Where how many people do you think nowadays, Dutch, that are doing this, ever had to really rely on this for survival? You know what I mean? Well, Where like, yeah, oh, it's a it's it's a tough existence. Yeah, it, but like, it really is. When you either if you don't wrestle, you don't eat type of stuff, and I think like, because that is the ultimate arbiter of like, are you good at this or not? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, if you, is it is this your only option, and can you do it? You know, I think. But hey, uh, I yeah. like. It, it, I don't want to tell the story of the, the fishing expedition, but when I was in Puerto Rico this past August, I made Eddie tell it because that was well, I, well. You you may have it. Let me tell it real quick. Joe Vicky told me one time that he he saved Carlos. And what what was the kid? Eddie Eddie Cologne. Eddie Eddie. They had went they had went fishing and went out into the ocean, and <laughs> and they had rented this boat from one of their friends who was one of the announcers, and it started taking on water, and it got it it was, and it was going to sink, and Joe Bika <laughs> told him he says they said oh and they didn't have life preservers I don't think. no they they took off. And the boat got flipped upside down. They got nervous. So they wanted to remember that? Well, I, I knew it was taking on water. I don't know what caused it. It was taking on water. And they said, hey, we got to get out of here. So they, I guess the, the whoever was driving panicked and he floored the boat. They forgot to put the anchor up. So like oh, yeah. they take off and the boat gets like jerked. It's upside down. They fly in the air and they yeah. land and everyone lands. Remember that? And they're all floating. And yeah, this is also I remember now. Not making this up, I right by a tuna factory where the sharks were there. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it, and and Joe Vigan, boys, do not worry. I swim to shore. I get to help. <laughs> and I, and he started swimming. It's like two miles. He had a beer says, cooler. They said he had oh, a beer uh, cooler because they were hanging on to the boat. And they said when he left, Carlos and Eddie thought they were going to die. Yeah, they thought they were going to drown, Carlos especially. I heard Carlos says, "You know, I love you, and you know, if you make it, tell your mama I love her." And and they said about he was gone a while. It takes a while to swim two miles. Who? So like he and he came back, and they saw this boat coming toward them about an hour into the water or more, where they've been treading water, losing hope, more hope by the second. And all of a sudden, a light hit them, and they heard a voice. Boys, I told you I'd come back. Like <laughs> Washington got crossing him. the Delaware. He got him. He got in the boat, and he said, but the first time I heard this story, I went, bullshit. That's not a true story. But then later on, I kept researching it, and yeah, he, he told the right story. But if you know Javika, you, you say, nah, he couldn't swim two miles, but he could. And and he saved them. So, and the best was, I guess, how he was picked up. They said by a fishing boat. A fishing boat was coming in late, and they thought he was maybe somebody that I don't know, like was drowning or trying to get somewhere. And they shine a light on him. And I guess he said they shine the light on him. They went, Jovica, and because they they recognized him from TV. <laughs> and he was floating. He goes, Yes, I have Carlos. And they, <laughs> and they went and saved him. That that's oh, yeah. how. It, 
So he never yeah. made it all the way to shore. A, a Coast Guard boat came across and found yeah, it. No, it was a fishing boat. Like that just a happened fishing to be coming boat. back late and happened to see him. Well, so crazy. I remember, but I remember the story. It's about ten years old, and I forgot a lot. But what a hell of a story! I was in Croatian Navy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we made a trip, folks. We made a trip to Europe. And the whole, uh, about an hour or two hours, we just sat and told Jovica stories mm -hmm. and, and you, and used his voice as one of the best trips I ever made, really. So it was a lot of fun. I, I remember that one. That was, that, that was up there for me too. And yeah. uh, we were laughing and laughing. And I remember Swagger was looking at us. He didn't know what we were talking about. He said, why yeah. are you guys laughing? And I said, you'd have to be there. It wouldn't be funny if you don't know the guy. But it yeah, was funny like, to us, and that's all that mattered. So but, what I say, but, what I what I say, people that listen to this show, it's like taking a trip in a car, a wrestling trip. You just sit in the back seat and listen to two guys talk back and forth, and a lot of people enjoy that because we just got to keep them updated. Now the 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 Puerto Rican stuff uh, is only relevant now because they just had that big backlash down there and I were telling people how the fans were and uh, they were brutal at times, brutal. Mm -hmm. uh, but Joe Vica, what he would do, he always sold tickets. Let me ask, how many shows did you see in Puerto Rico that ever started on time? None. Zero. Because they live on Puerto Rican time and I think wrestling down there lives on its own time too. They might advertise 8.30, which could mean 9.17. Nine, yep. Or, or 20 to 10. It's whenever he feels like starting the show. Yep. And he has his own concessions, and he would go in and set his concessions up, and the intermissions are like an, uh, about 30, 40 minutes long, so he can sell all the, the panadillas. And all the hot dogs he's got cooking, and sell, and he sells beer, and he sells yep. coats. He makes more money off the concession he makes at the gate. Yep. So yep, and and that's the way he's done business all these years, and I don't think he's going to change. Did I tell you I had to wrestle him in Trinidad? Oh, uh, Trinidad, that's another whole story too. Tell yeah. me about Trin Trinidad. No, I'll, I'll just be honest. It was, it was two nights, and he was wrestling Tony Atlas. I came down there, got got some steam on him, whatever. We make a challenge next night. And this is at um, – not Jose Paparin, uh Juan something called Steam in Trinidad. It hadn't been there for years. And Jovica and, – and back me up on this, Dutch, or tell me I'm lying. He is the – in Trinidad, he is the equivalent to a Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yeah, he was like, over – for some reason, he is so over in Trinidad, it's crazy. So, like, there's this reception for him, and, and it was a match where, like, the fans can have their belts, and they whip the crap out of you. So, <laughs> he was so amped up to go. They play my music, which is this rock thing, and I'm getting ready to go through the curtain, and he's standing there in a single, and he goes like this. He goes, he pushes me out of the way and walks to the ring. To your music? To my music. And people are going nuts, and then I come out to the some kind of Croatian music that, and it's like it got heat, and like he never mentioned a word of it. He just was like he he wanted to go to the ring with my music, or or he wanted to go to the ring first. Screw the music, people. Screw everything. I'm doing this now. Was what it was. I mean, what am I gonna do? I remember when they first started Trinidad. I, I did their, they speak English there. And I did the TV for them. And the first time we went down there, they go to that outside stadium. I don't know if you saw it or not. Yeah, that's the one we wrestled in. Okay. But this Port stadium Spain, right? was uh, Port of Spain. Yeah. It was packed. The floor was packed. It seats about 10,000. They had to be 12,000 people there. And I'm saying, what the hell? But Trinidad, I had trouble getting my money out mm. because <laughs> if you if you try to go to the bank, they don't give you what it's worth in U.S. dollars. 
you go on the, to the cab drivers, you get about a third of what it's worth. You know how I got my money out of Trinidad? Oh. I would I would go to the American Airlines office and buy, say I had two thousand TT dollars, what they say. I ask them where would this get me, and they'll tell me, well, you can go to L.A. You can go. I said, get me the ticket that's takes most of this money. I got several tickets to L.A. And when I got back to San Juan, I'd wait mm-hmm. about a week. Then I'd go down to the American Airlines office and said, I'm not going to use this ticket. Can you refund me? And they'd refund all my money. That's how wow. I got my money. That's how I got my money out. But I didn't tell any wow. of the other wrestlers because if something can get screwed up, tell a bunch of wrestlers. Yep. So I, I didn't tell anybody. So listen, yep. appreciate you being on the show today. Mm. I, I, I'd like to do one where we just tell stories. And I would love that. Yes. So for the, I think the fans, they, they love the stories more than they love the dissecting the business. They've heard that so many times, but yeah. you can't, you, you, if you can tell a good story, people will always listen. So where can the people find you? Uh, so on social media? Can, uh, or? Yeah. On, on Twitter. I don't have the blue check mark anymore because uh, I just don't think you should have to pay to prove who you are. Um, but it's, uh, a uh, A R O N S thoughts. That's Aaron's thoughts on Instagram. And I'm working on. I'm trying to get verified on Instagram. This is quite a process. But on Instagram, it is the Aaron Files. T H E A R O N Files. So that's a uh, mm-hmm. you know pretty cool thing. And uh, again, kind of using social media now for for good. I hope. And uh, and that's it. And of course, you can find me on NWA. We also we got the Crockett Cup coming up, um, June third and fourth. And uh, and Dutch, you know what? If we're ever in the area, or like, if it would be great to see you at NWA, you would, uh, you know, again, if, if you'd like to, it'd, it'd be awesome to see you. Well, I've been needing surgery for like a couple of years mm-hmm. because of mobility problems. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't think the last time I worked in TNA, mm-hmm. I didn't really enjoy it that much. I did, but I didn't because okay. they had so so many problems there, and I just. just you know, if, if it doesn't run smooth, I don't want to be there. Here's here's the thing. When Dr. Tom showed up in Knoxville to say hi, yep. Yep. it was pretty much like, hey, Doc, um, like you work here now, right? He goes, what? No, no, no. We went to Billy and we're like, hey, boss, um, Doc would really do well here. And like Dr. Tom has been, it, 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 it was a year ago. He just like has been at every show since and uh, and he likes it. It's just when you say telling stories like this is like we've created a locker room that we want to foster, again, creativity, but that sense of just having common sense and respect and, you know, working together, which is what, um, you know, as NWA, that is who we are. That's what we're trying to do. Like we're not out there to make a political statement. We're there to just simply entertain you with wrestling you know north american television wrestling which by the way in my opinion has always been the superior form which is why when americans have always gone to japan they have been massive stars right now Mm -hmm. not and this is not to take away from japanese wrestling in fact i've I've now developed a new respect for it getting to know some people i have and and like what it is but in terms of just television and selling out arenas and becoming a star you know, the way to do it is the way that you and I have been talking about. Well, they, they keep doing it that way because you know why it works. Yes. And when you yeah. find something that works, don't reinvent the wheel when it's already spinning. I, yes. I, 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 I never understood that. So I appreciate you being here. James, do you have any questions for, for Mr. Damien? I do. I have loads. Uh, I'll try and stick to, <laughs> I was trying, trying to stick to one or two if you're okay with that, Aaron. By the way, yes, I have met Lanny Poffo, and we were in communication up until he recently passed. So Lanny was wonderful, and his uh, his quote was, uh, yes, you know what? Everything I've done, I've stole from someone else. You can have it. You have my blessing. He's a phenomenal man. When I had to do the Macho Mandow gimmick, whatever it was called, I called him out of respect, and he was just as gracious. Mm. So that I have nothing but positive memories of Lanny. Absolutely. I mean, when I talked to him, like the few times, because he was my very first ever interview as well, and I and I oh, yeah. said this to him, 
if if he'd have been anything but like the incredibly nice and gracious and friendly, I don't think I would have ever done a second. Because man, I was yeah. so nervous doing it, and man, he put me. He, oh wow! He put me to ease. He was such a nice guy, and I think he just yeah. moved to Ecuador a couple of years beforehand. He'd show me around his yeah. apartment, the uh, uh, view straight over the ocean. So he had it made yeah. at that point. It was great. Did, you know what yeah. impressed? You know what impressed me about Lanny when he was oh. living in Ecuador? <laughs> oh, he oh, had okay. he no he had five different housekeepers female housekeepers so does that tell you anything <laughs> I'm, and i'm sure he's written a poem about it oh uh, yeah five a day he was he was living the life and he was enjoying life and he was a good I'm, i knew him since he was about 17 wow i met him when we i started working in atlanta and then angelo papo brought lanny and uh Randy with him and Randy was still doing the, the Spider-Man gimmick. And that, and then he had to leave early to go to baseball, but wow. that, that's where I first met him. Oh, can, continue oh. James. Didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, well, uh, I would like to ask this and it's sort of maybe a two part question possibly, but were you Aaron there in OVW the day that Jim Cornette got fired and uh, any Paul Heyman stories from when Paul took over from Jim and how his method of running OVW uh, differed from Jim's? Um, you know, it, it's funny where back then I thought they were polar opposites. And in a lot of ways they are. But they are far more similar than I think either wants to admit, especially when you compare what they have done and, and the answer to that, the first answer is I, yes, I was there for both bookers. Um, but they were so similar. It's almost like this, right? If, um, if we are in a dance competition and you think wearing a suit and tie is the best wardrobe, right, for the competition, and somebody else thinks blue jeans and a T-shirt is. Fundamentally, though, the dance is still the same. The same steps, the same rhythm, the same beat. It's just minor things that really don't have anything to do with the actual, like, technicality of it, if that makes sense, right? Um, that is how I equate their differences, but I learned from both. Um, Jimmy, I, I was closer with Jimmy, um, and to, to this day, in a lot of ways, am, uh, and I consider myself a, a, a student of his because I was fortunate to learn. Although Paul treated me very well, Paul treated me fairly, and Paul gave me the platform to perform and, and the knowledge he had as to how to execute my characters as best as I could. And I am, I'm grateful to both of them. Who was Paul's booker at the time? Is it Al Snow or was it several books? No, Paul was doing it. Paul was doing it. Okay. Where does that where does Al Snow fit into all this then? Was he um... Al took over after Paul. Oh really? What was this? 2007, and maybe? It was around there, yeah. Um but and I tell you what, it was a privilege. I'll say this too. Working for Al was a privilege. And 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 I I cannot say enough how good of a human being Al Snow is and how good he is at what he does is training people. Um and Al Al is you know, at, at the top of the list in my book, and I mean that. I uh, I didn't tell either of you before we started this, but my interview guest for my other channel tomorrow is Rip Rogers as well. So, any, I'm going to have to ask him to like rein it in slightly, I think. But uh... tell him I said hi. Yeah. <laughs> Dutch, do you want to close off? Well, I can <clears throat> tell Rip I said hello. Good guy. Can I tell a little rip story real quick? Of course you can. Please. We were in Louisville one night, and Rip and Randy Savage were on the outs. And they were arguing, and I don't know if they were still working together, 
And this comes from Rips and Randy's company over there in Lexington, Kentucky. But I remember Randy was in the dressing room and I think Rip came in or Randy came in and they started fighting and we pulled them apart outside the dressing room. And I never will forget. Nobody won the fight, to tell you the truth. And, <laughs> and I remember Rip's final statement. He says, well, I can't fight too good, but I prove one thing. I said, what? He said, Savage can't either. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was, that's how they ended that up. And I don't know. Those, those guys were, they were together for a long, long time in, in that company. So anyway, let's wrap this up and appreciate your time, Mr. Damien. Likewise, like, Dutch. Like to do it again. And, uh, I will, uh, Look for a chance we can have you back. And remember, I want you to think of some of those old stories that we've probably forgotten because I would like to, especially like you were telling me the stories of, and some, some of those stories I never even heard. I'm sitting here like a fan going, Oh yeah. What happened then? What happened then? What happened then? And that's, that's what I think a good podcast is. You can listen, you can enjoy and at the same time, learn something. So I will sign off for me and James to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Damien. We the people. See you next week.